Um, so I'm Dan. I, this is my side project. I do this for fun um, and for a lot of learning. I'm going to go through the story. My day-to-day -day job is CTO at Superbalist, um, but I've been working on Escom's Push for the last couple of years, and I'm going to take you through my journey and Hammond's journey. But yeah, proudly South African. We use a lot of South African lingo, uh, and we like to make people laugh. So that's one of our key things. Um, we've got some users, and, and they kind of come, and then they go away. And then they come, and then they go away. And when they come, they come very quickly, and they surprise us every time. So this is active users. If anyone's familiar with Firebase Analytics, uh, which we use in the app, um, this, this is the data from there, and this is showing on the right-hand side a one-day active, seven-day active, and 28-day active. Uh, this isn't our full user base. Our full user base, if you look at across the, since we rebuilt the app in 2018, it's about 3.2 million users that have used the app. But our peak uh, for a single month is 1.9 million, and in a single day, we've seen, what is that? 1.25 million um, in a single day, and they arrive in an instant. Uh, South Africa, we've got you covered. Um, yeah. Uh, some of my favorite moments. Um, so I've done some interesting interviews, and Hammond's put me in these situations as well. So Hammond typically watches the emails a little bit more than I do, and he sees some of the emails come through from, from some interesting news agencies. And one of the ones was, hey, Dan, you're going to go meet Jeremy Maggs on Saturday morning at 8 AM. OK. <laughs> that was an interesting interview. Um, I, I played around with Jeremy Maggs a little bit, and I, I said to him that Harman is your biggest fan. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I knew that we had struck gold uh, with South Africa when I recently got a picture of myself in the Heiskenut. <laughs> um, I was, it was a very proud moment, and if you look, uh, Hammond wasn't so chuffed with this, <laughs> which was stolen from this. Um, but I was marched around like a show pony with my laptop and phone at the eatery in Media 24, which is across the road from where I work. <laughs> but my Afrikaans is not very good, and the whole interview is in Afrikaans, so I'm quite proud of my Afrikaans, um, even though I did it in English. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we've had a bunch of news articles, and it's, uh, it's often interesting just to have a sway to the, the journalists' articles are always after we haven't had load shedding for a while, and then suddenly we have a lot of load shedding. And this is exactly what happens. So we go from 2,500 users to now 1.25 million users in a single moment, which is frightening. Um, so yeah, Dan. Uh, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm a director of a company called Well, Well, Well Pty Ltd. Um, we created a company back in 2015 because we've got a bit of a cheeky name, um, and I personally didn't feel like being sued. Um, so we created a company, and this company actually owns this app. Um, I'm Dan, and I work on this with Hadman. We're a 100% remote first company. Um, <laughs> we, we don't have an office. Uh, we, we encourage flexible time. Uh, <laughs> All of these great things. Unfortunately, we're not hiring. Um, and our ratio is not good. Uh, yeah. So I'm just preempting that question. Uh, I look at mostly platform stuff, although I do play with the app quite a lot. Um, I've recently, uh, we've jumped into Flutter. I'll talk about it a little bit. I'm a big evangelist for it. And we've started using it at work as well. For uh, fun projects, our grad project at Superbless, they're using Flutter, which is quite cool. Um, and I like to think of myself as a dot connector, which is basically someone who, who likes integrating things. Not always in the best way, but in the quickest, simplest way to make things work. And then once you hit 1.25 million users, you make it a bit better. Um, Hammond, very much focused on app marketing, understanding users. 
He's also, you know, jumped into the code base. He messes around with the cloud functions. He was playing with them today. Um, and uh, he's having a bit of load shedding currently because his wife just had a baby two weeks ago. So he hasn't been uh, playing with the app much over the last two weeks. But yeah, he's very focused on the users. What are the users doing? Like, how do we make it better? How do we, how do we help them, actually? So yeah, what the F? Um, why have we done this? Um, so load shedding schedules are really shit. Um, when I'll take you through the history, but how we basically started was we kept on getting surprised that load shedding was happening. And I don't know if you remember back to 2014, 2015, you're getting phone calls from your family, from your friends, like, are you getting load shedded? How do you read the schedules? Then you're printing these things out, and these are a couple from a couple of different municipalities. Um, you're printing them out, uh, the font is really small, and you're going through them with a highlighter or a ruler and trying to work out when you're getting load shed. And then a week later, your municipality decides, nope, Kirsten Bosch is not group eight anymore, it's now group 12. <laughs> and you move along. So we said, no, let's, let's try and make something that actually makes our lives easier. And that was kind of our start. So back in December 2014, um, we had a lot of load shedding. So I don't know if you know this, but the app's been around since then. Um, and in December 2014, we had this, uh, this idea, wrote a little Python script, deployed it to a South African cloud provider, and it just connected to push bullets, and it sent us the schedule for the day for our areas that we were interested in. And that was cool. Um, we had a different name back then, I think. And then Hammond and I, who were sharing an office and working at the same company at the time, obviously we did this outside of work hours. Um, we <laughs> had a, a, a bunch of people in our office who you know, were also outside of their working hours. Um, and we went through a handful of names. We're like, cool, let's make a name for it. Let's, let's come up with a name. Um, and somehow we settled on ESCOM, SIP PUSH. So to explain that, <laughs> it was a thing that sent push notifications and it's ESCOM schedule. So we were like, cool, well, that's the technology, right? But also, we were working in mobile banking security and out-of-band authentication. So and with a lot of South African banks who have some very strong Afrikaans accents. And when you're on a teleconference or a video conference, uh, push often comes across quite different than a strong Afrikaans accent. And we used to have a little bit of a chuckle over a, over a teleconference. Um, so that was how we sort of played it in. Um, there are some other theories, but they're not true. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in February, we were like, cool, over December, we're going to January, February, we, we were like, oh, it's kind of useful, we got 70 users subscribed um, on our Push Bullet channel, we're like, we're, we're nailing it, rocking it. Um, Hammond had some experience with uh, PhoneGap in Cordova, and Ionic had just been released at the time. So, uh, yeah, I'll get into the details, we launched uh, uh, our first app, version 1.0, um, in Ionic. We were actually mentioned in the release notes for Ionic version one, which is like a woo. Um, and it was Android and iOS, uh, and very simple. Um, then May, later in the year, we had about 20,000 users. There were a couple of other sort of load shedding apps around at that time, I don't know if you remember them as well. Um, and we were having lots of fun with them on Twitter and sort of annoying them. Um, but yeah, we had 20,000 users. This is when Jeff, arrived. I don't know if anyone re reads the actual change log in the app uh, when we send out updates. But we had this uh, partner um, named Jeff, and Jeff one night was working a bit late, and uh, he decided to build a new feature for push notifications, um, and something went wrong at 6 o'clock in the morning, and over 21 minutes we sent out, I think it was 3.8 million notifications to these 20,000 users. <laughs> so yeah, I think the notes were, Jeff found the issue at 11 minutes past, had fixed the issue by 19 minutes past, 
and at 21 minutes past, he got fired. <laughs> Obviously, I don't do this at work, but uh, in my side projects, we take things very seriously. Um, then, yeah, throughout our release notes, you'll have to look through the changelog in the app, but, uh, you know, we've uh, invited him back. He's currently in France, um, enjoying his French villa, um, not having any load shedding. Um, but, yeah, we're in the Huawei app gallery now. Just interesting decision. Um, but, yeah, later in the year, uh, we got to about... 250,000 users, and we won App of the Year, and literally on that night, load shedding ended. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, okay, cool, well, perfect timing. Um, uh, following year, nothing, so it slowly turned down the server infrastructure. The app, after a year, sort of went into zombie state, fell off the stores. Um, and we just kind of forgot about it. We kept the server stuff running, um, but all the licenses and certificates and things had expired. So yeah, this was the app back then. Uh, it was about six days to development um, in Ionic. Um, we did some horrible things, um, and we kept the app incredibly simple, and we have done that to this day as well. So the schedules are server-side, um, we scraped quite a lot of stuff. Well, we did scrape quite a lot of stuff from ESCOM and municipalities back then and cached them. I say heavily, we've done it much better now. Um, and then, yeah, we, we always used to say publicly that we had inside info, um, but uh, we would like to say things to just make people shut up sometimes because we're just two guys. <laughs> um, so very simple, ionic, um, and everything server-side, really. Uh, we had to write, uh, rewrite this thing called Pulses Push, um, because back then Firebase didn't exist and you couldn't have topics and things like that. So we actually had to get the tokens, send out the tokens to every single device. So we rewrote something called Pulses so that I could do it um, multi-threaded and we could get through the whole batch of users immediately. So one of our principles since day one is we don't delay the notification. It, it goes to everyone immediately, um, which is fun. Um, and yeah, I don't open the app. <laughs> so yeah, the app now, it's written in Flutter. Um, in 2018, decided over a winter holiday, I want to learn something new, um, jumped into Flutter, and it was about 40 hours of weekend time, couch time, to what I call minimum lovable product. Um, server side, nothing changed. Uh, it has changed quite substantially now, but I'll get through the details. Um, and then more Firebase stuff. So using Firebase messaging, Firebase topics, um, remote config, all of the pretty things. And we added a lot more color into it. Um, and then we've added some other features, but I'll get into those as well. So yeah, 13th of September, uh, Dan spent some time on a couch and uh, two and a half thousand lines of code later, not much. Uh, version two released the Play Store we immediately got 25 users, which from Apple, which was automatically updates, and then in Play Store, there were still some people that had the app from 2015 that automatically got updated. So we had about 40 users. But the purpose of actually doing it was me learning Flutter, and Hammond also jumped into it subsequently after this, and we tweaked with it quite a while. But it was, it was a successful project, and then we kind of forgot about it. So yeah, September. 2018 launch version two, uh, 40 users. In December, it actually started in November. Um, it was three days before Black Friday. Um, and I got a push notification from my app saying load shedding has started. And I was like, I cannot do Black Friday and load shedding at the same time. <laughs> so one of them is gonna have to be turned off. Um, and, and it definitely wasn't take a lot. Uh, fortunately, it was just a, it was like four hours, and it was just like a, hey, load shedding is happening for this time, and it went away. In December, um, it kicked in again full speed, and we immediately went from these 40 users up to 300-odd thousand. Within, uh, I think it was two or three days, we jumped up. December then was quite February. Uh, we, oh, so actually, with that version, we decided, let's experiment with some new features. 
So we built in a almost like an Instagram type feed into the app, and you could publish something into Facebook or into Instagram. And if you used the push good uh, hashtag, it would pull it into the app, and we could show this feed to all of our users in a way to like get rid of a bit of negativity around load shedding. So we all agree load shedding sucks. Um, but if we can make people smile and encourage them to do good stuff or to even think good thoughts, we can manipulate people in a very positive way. So you'll see everything in take in in Eskimos Push is uh, it's got a very positive swing to it, and everything we try and do is very positive. Uh, that experiment sucked; it didn't work. <laughs> we turned it off. Um, <laughs> I think we got like one person complaining and then we got a handful of other people and we just used remote config and we, we wiped that off the, off the face of the app. In February, uh, we decided, no, cool, let's just continue uh, sort of doing things behind the scenes. Kept it going and then, yeah, by March, we had 1.3 uh, million active users, so in a single day, uh, how many users, uh, act, sorry, in a, in, a, in a month, that's how many we had active. Um, and we rolled out a new version which had chat in it. Um, in, in a way, we'll get into a bit of the details, I'll we'll go through a weird story here, how we, what we did then. And then in October, we actually, we dropped quite a lot because load shedding had, um, had ended and I think we had one or two days in October. So we've got this like very cyclical user base um, and it follows load shedding, obviously. Um, yeah, so last year into this year, um, November again, similar to last year, October. Um, oh, shit. Uh, about yeah, six, 650,000. December, uh, we went to stage six for the first time ever. That uh, gave us a whole bunch of users. We had quite a, quite a bit of fun on it in social media. Um, and uh, yeah, we got a bunch more users. February this year, it's just it's it's just going up and up. Oh my God! Stop it. <laughs> cool. So we've got some users. <laughs> Stop. Julian, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like. It, it, this is a normal South African thing. I don't know if any of you have any companies that run apps that users use, but this is a, a fairly normal South African thing. Like, really great app, amazing, life-changing, I use it every day, four stars. <laughs> Julian's obviously one of them. He's probably, you know, the leader of the people who do this. We get some very nice reviews as well. So Astrid, you know, most valuable app on my phone right now. This is the reason why we do this app. Um, this, this amount of gratitude that we get from people from supplying this free community app is actually one of the reasons why we do it. We don't do it for, for profits. We don't do it for, um, for money. We have no one paying us. Um, we've got a small amount of ad revenue that's coming in that's allowing us to elastically change our, our infrastructure. But this is mainly the reason why we do it, is gratitude. And also, yeah, we get to experiment with it. We also get some weird things, and people think we're ESCOM. <laughs> <laughs> What's really funny is, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> it's like, I, I didn't do this to you, Debbie. Um, we also get some very, very angry emails. Um, so I, I redacted that, um, code of conduct and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, very rude. And people very much thinking we were ESCOM and, um, or that we've given them false information and therefore they're reaching out to us and telling us how bad we are. Um, but yeah, bring it back. We do it for the gratitude. Um, and this is the stuff that keeps us going. If we were just getting rude emails all the time, we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't keep moving. Um, we've also kind of stopped reading the emails. <laughs> um, yeah, so Hammond, as I was saying earlier, he loves to play with users, he loves to understand them, he also likes to fuck with me. Um, so I'll get through the server infrastructure, but last year, March, we had some serious problems. Um, so every time the push notification went out and we went from 
no users to 1.3 million users. It was hurting quite a lot, and we were doing some terrible things behind the scenes, which I'll get into details about. Um, but I added something into the stack, and it actually helped things out quite a lot. Um, and Hammond decided, no, he's going to put this message inside the app, saying Dan fixed it, and please thank Dan on Twitter. <laughs> um, with a link to my Twitter account um, at, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning. I was in a management stand-up at the time, and my phone just ridiculous, going completely off. Um, some good articles come out, coming out of it, like why I trended on Twitter, which is, you know, this is just the strangest thing for me to see. But yeah, um, a lot of fun. So Hammond, he's, he's very good at, at messing with me. We also like uh, playing with our users a bit. So this year, uh, Valentine's Day, out to dinner with my wife. Um, she actually wrote this message to you. Um, and we sent this out as a bit of fun. So we don't always have to be very serious, saying stage two is going to happen at nine. Um, we don't have that. We can, those messages go out automatically, but we can also engage with our users on a little bit more of a personal matter. And uh, this, this was a fun one. Had quite a, quite a large engagement on Reddit, uh, Facebook, Twitter. Um, but yeah, it was a message from my wife. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so the only technical stuff that I talk about. So yeah, where we started. So we had a, a, a little instance, um, a little VPS running in a South African cloud provider, um, and we used Pushbullet, a little bit of Python. Um, that would have the schedules on, on the server, which is formulated into like a text format and send it on a Pushbullet channel. Um, very simple, great, awesome. So then we built an app. Um, Basically, we took the thing that generated the push bullet text and we wrapped it in Python Flask. Um, and then we were like, well, that doesn't work so well, so we added a bit of memcached. Um, then that didn't work so well, so we said, well, we need to do some other things. We're storing tokens on phones as well. So we added MongoDB um, because MongoDB was sexy in 2015 and it was infinitely scalable in all of these things. So we added that. Um, we still have it, uh, because it's fine. Um, but yeah, Nginx, Flask, a little server, and off we went. Um, we shortly discovered that if you put quite a lot of pressure on memcache, that it just fucks out and restarts itself. And then you have an empty cache. So we added Redis, because um, that could slowly just persist it to disk. And then when it started up again, it would bring it back into memory. Um, I was probably doing some terrible things as well. And we also made this single server quite a lot bigger. And then, you know, Cloudflare was all the rage. Um, so we added Cloudflare, made the server quite a lot bigger um, because it was just a single instance of a Flask app. And we did some of those horrible things that we learned about at Meerkat yesterday with CTL commands and we were fiddling with all the settings. Um, Cloudflare, also the free account's got some serious limitations in that um, I think it's over 100,000 requests per minute. It just thinks you're under attack or something, and it just drops off 90% of your traffic. Um, the business account, that goes up a bit higher, but we didn't want to spend $200 because we didn't have any ad revenue at this time. So in 2015, this was all coming out of our pockets, and we were throwing as much cheap stuff at it as possible. Then, yeah, nothing for a couple of years. Um, I learned a bit more uh, how to do things a bit better. And, Jesus. <laughs> Not presenting, clearly. Um, yeah, so in 2018, um, rebuilt it, uh, dockerized all the applications. So it's a monolith. It's really got five endpoints. It's, it's incredible. Um, containerized it because there's a bunch of cron jobs that right, happen around the scenes and built those into containers as well. Still used Mongo, still used Redis, and we split it across multiple servers, and we used HAProxy to load balance the traffic across. We were still in the same cloud provider as well, um, and we slowly added a few more machines, um, a, a few more HAProxies, but kept it there. Then, in, in an effort to actually understand what our application was doing, we added a bit of Graphite, a bit of Grafana, we added more machines, more HA proxy, um, and then I won't mention their names because they are incredible. 
Um, but our cloud provider in South Africa told us to fuck right off um, because we were taking other legitimate companies off the internet, basically, every time we overloaded their firewall. Um, yeah, so, so instead of us just being connected directly to the internet, which was their solution, um, and, and sort of adjacent to their firewall, not behind it, uh, we decided, no, let's do something else. I won't mention their names, they are incredible. Um, Digital Ocean, yeah, we moved there. Uh, we also moved quite a bit of the app uh, functionality off into Firestore, which is incredible. Um, which is an, a Firebase thing, it's, it's a Google product, um, it's really great. We used the digital ocean load balancers, which meant that uh, we could take, we didn't have to handle the SSL uh, and the, the cert stuff, and that took quite a bit of CPU load off us as well. And we added something else, and I don't know if anyone knows what that is. Shout it out. No one? Okay, it's varnish. No? Okay. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, it does this amazing thing, and it actually fits our user uh, behavior perfectly. So Varnish is a, it's a HTTP reverse proxy, basically. Um, but, and it's incredibly lightweight, and it's got a, you configure it in something called VCL, like, uh, which is a language to configure it. And it does something which can handle a, like a herd of users arriving, requesting the same thing at the same time. That's not even in your cache. So if you have one user coming in, hitting Varnish, Varnish says, I don't have it in my cache, makes a request to the back end. If you get another 1.3 million users coming in asking that same request, it says, I don't have it in my cache, but I'm fetching it. It doesn't make another 1.3 million requests to your back end. It actually waits for the response from the back end and returns the response to all of them at the same time, which is incredible. It's great. Um, for anyone running any system with spiky traffic, I would highly recommend it. And yeah, now we're using four digital ocean load balancers because they can handle 10,000 connections um, at a time. Uh, we actually technically need about 12. Um, we're running two giant varnish boxes for cache and we've got a whole fleet of uh, little application servers behind. When I say fleet, it's like three. But the, that's like fleet, right? You know, it's more than two. Um, still a tiny little Redis cache and a tiny little Mongo host, and we've still got Grafana and Graphite monitoring the stuff. Then also on the Google side, um, we've moved quite a lot of stuff into cloud functions, and we use BigQuery uh, quite extensively as well. Sorry, just checking my time. I don't want to get in the way of your beer. Yeah, so this is kind of our user traffic. Um, that's requests uh, per minute uh, on Varnish. And you can see it's, it's literally just that. So push notification goes out. If I have time, I might even do a demo. Um, and our backend API response. So that's actually the Python Flask uh, server behind the scenes. Um, the very spiky stuff was me changing the message that's on the app, and it's particularly slow. And then the traffic that actually came through is not too bad. I wouldn't say it's great. But in terms of handling the user traffic coming in and responding to them almost immediately, is, is good. So yeah, I was talking about not responding to emails. Um, it's a very legitimate thing. Uh, we added a new feature called Nearby Chat. Um, and the reason behind this is so that people can help each other. Um, they often would email us, and this is, a thing that happens all the time. It's two o'clock, you told me the power is going off at two o'clock. Sorry, it's, it's like five minutes past two, you told me it was going off at two, it didn't go off. And three minutes later, the power went off, you don't have to worry. Then two hours later, or two and a half hours later, the power hasn't come back on yet, you told me it was gonna come back on, it hasn't come back on yet, and then 10 minutes later, don't worry, it's come back on now. I'm like, please don't tell me, just speak to your neighborhood, and like, so maybe they know what's going on. Also, we're a load shedding app, which is a scheduled thing. We have no idea when there's an outage. We cannot work that out. So we would often get emailed or notified that there's an outage in an area, and we don't need to know. Um, we don't want to even know. 
but it might be nice that your neighbors, maybe they've called the, the council or the municipality and they know what is going on. Maybe there's a transformer that's exploded somewhere and they can help you. I can't help you because you know where you live better than I do. Um, so we added chat. It's a nearby chat. Um, it's, it works with geohashes, so I think at a geohash 5 level, you can chat within people in that area, which is quite cute. Um, it's completely serverless. It runs in Firestore, um, and it's all cloud functions. It's linked to a login. Uh, it has to be because of abuse and um, dick pics. Uh, <laughs> it took three months before the first dick pic, and I was genuinely surprised. I thought it was going to be day one. So we've also got abuse controls. Um, you can report users, and uh, a number of reports against the user will actually start deleting their chat, um, and then we can ban them as well. Uh, and, and then they, they remove their con chat. Uh, post images, links, uh, some of them you can't, uh, but some of them you can. And then you, you can like, there's a bit of vanity, and when you like something, that person gets a push notification, it's quite cute. And then yeah, we use Slack, um, so Slack ops, uh, so that we can manage things. Um, We've got some automated things that listen to the chats and just delete messages if they're using uh, basically all of the bad words that I'm not allowed to say in the code of conduct. Um, and if it's, uh, then people can uh, report users as well. And when they're reported, if they're reported a certain amount of time, they are banned. But if we see something specifically quite bad, we can manually click a button which hits a cloud function and it just bans them which is great. We can also individually delete chats, which is very cool. We don't pay for Slack. We're using the free one, of course. Um, so after a while, we lose the messages. <laughs> um, yeah, so we added login um, through Firebase Auth. And we added three different methods. So you could use your cell phone number. Sorry, Anna, that's really small. You could use your cell phone number. Um, you could use Facebook, and you can use Google. and there was a bout of load shedding that happened um, last year in October, and we left the SMS stuff on. Um, you get 10,000 free, and then after that, I think you pay six US cents per authentication, and we had 28,500, uh, so nice, and this was after two and a half days, uh, and we got a nice $1,100 bill from Google Cloud, which is a little bit horrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Firestore, uh, we use it extensively. Um, I know these numbers are terrible. How does this work? But we paid about $450 on Firestore in February, uh, which sounds like a lot. It is a lot. Um, but we did, like, I don't know, over 500 million reads and over I don't know, 31 million writes or something. Fantastic. Another database I don't need to look after, and it sort of just covers itself. It does have limits. Don't write to the same document from everyone, because you get a rude email from Google. Yeah, some of the features we've added. Um, this is, I'll just quickly go through them. Uh, dark mode, obviously. Um, <laughs> Very important. Uh, recommended areas, it's a little bit fucky. I don't know if you've played with it. Um, and which, what it does is it's, every time you add an area, it actually adds it into this, but we need to tweak it on the other side. But it actually does find the areas that were in your area. We just need to tweak it a little bit. It's quite cute. And then also, yeah, the ability to log in with Facebook and, and Google, and we removed that because it's, ouch. Um, yeah, we've had some interesting experiences. Um, so every time there is load shedding, we immediately go to number one, which is crazy. Um, it's quite, quite interesting because my real day job is sort of in a top 20 app, and then my side hustle project is also <laughs> a top 20 app, and then like, I'm like, is someone gonna throw something at me because I'm, I'm winning you know, in my private project? 
but uh, it's it's very nice. It's it's really great as a as an individual, me and Hammond, to have this app that connects us to 3.2 million people, which is just I I don't, I don't even know. Like that's a lot of people. Like this is 400. Um, yeah, so this is something that we think about all the time. So every feature and everything that we think of with Eskom Supush is we want to build apps to help improve South Africans' lives. The reason behind that is, like, there's a lot of negativity happening all the time. Um, there's a lot of negative things. We hear about corona, we hear about load shedding, we've got water shortages, or day zero is coming, and the, the news is very negative. We put a positive spin on that, on that South Africa, there are some huge opportunities here, and there's massive opportunities. The companies that we're working on are taking advantage of these opportunities, and we're doing really great things, and please continue it. But let's not get stuck in the negativity. Like, let's actually put a positive spin on things. Let's be grateful for the things that we have, and, and be, be grateful to the people that are around us to you know, work with us to do these great things. So that's kind of my story. I've got one more thing. Ha -ha. <laughs> so. Vouchers for everyone. Um, no. <laughs> I know the logo is usually the other way around, but I'm a bit biased. Um, I asked my engineering team to build us a slide. Um, here are some of the things that we use at Superbulous and some of the things that take a lot. Um, some great ones here, like fucking Oracle. Uh, Let's get fucked up. Uh, hmm, new relic, click, hmm, MariaDB, some interesting things, Cloudflare, Slack, lots of, uh, Superbulous actually operates through Slack. Varnish, incredible, have to have it. View, obviously. Joe, across the whole take a look group we're hiring. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions? I have stickers as back. well. Yeah. Hi, Dan. My name's Maggot Mouth, and I was wondering, have you seen my tag? I think he's asking if anyone's seen a tag that says Maggot Mouth Did you find it? on it. It's very important <laughs> to Maggot Mouth. <laughs> Question of the day. If you do find it... Hi. Um, I just wanted to know, where do you switch dark mode on? Because I have the app and <laughs> there ain't no dark mode. It's, a, it's an Easter egg. You have to have it on at OS level. So if you turn it on at your OS level, it'll immediately turn on. Okay, thanks. And my second question is, the pop-up ads, I don't mind them at all, but why when you use far and whenever it pops up in the middle of your screen? S sorry, could you repeat that? So the pop-up ads, they yes. pop up in the middle of your screen. Why? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just a little banner. It can be like... Why is it in the middle? <laughs> we we spent uh, months on usability and UX, <laughs> and and those were in the designs. Um, I'll I'll you'll have to bring it up with Hammond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any plans for Corona? You know, I used hand sanitizer before I even came up here. Um, we, we're thinking of different things that we could share, um, and Corona is one of the things. Uh, what we're trying to think of now is how we put a positive spin on it. <laughs> Open to ideas. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Um, with, because your app is push-based, 
Are you planning on future proofing because Huawei will be uh, will be banned from using Google services? So, are we planning to um, implement that in the future for the um, within the next two months? Uh, yeah. So, we've got a lot of things that are Google Play services related. Um, Push being one of them. Uh, login being one of them. Uh, Firestore works, I think. We can't use remote config. We can't use dynamic links. Can't use intents. Something like that. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that don't work that are in uh, Huawei's HMS. We've have, we have been chatting with Huawei, um, and yeah, we, yeah, we'll see. The, the APK as it is existing with the Google services is in the app gallery, but if you've got a Huawei device that doesn't have Play services, there's a bunch of things that won't work. It kind of works. Uh, which one of you is the Celine Dion fan? <laughs> <laughs> it, it used to be near, far, and random, and then we changed it to near, far, and whatever, and then wherever just sounded so much better. We can change it on remote config. Um, the name of the, the room behind the scenes is actually random, um, but we can change quite a lot of the application in remote config, including those tab names. Cool. Any more? Going, going? Go on. Let's thank Dan.